glad to see all of you, the familiar faces and some of the, uh, of the new ones. What we're going to be talking about today is betting and spending addiction uh, and how we can't buy love. You know, it's Christmas time and a lot of times people will spend money that they really don't have to, uh, thinking that it's going to express love. And, you know, really how you spell love is T-I-M-E. <laughs> You know, if people could, you know, uh, spend more time with their children, uh, grandchildren, their families, and it's hard, it's difficult in this uh, time of the pandemic. Uh, so, but also spending and betting addiction, uh, <coughs> uh, addictions come in clusters, and the cluster with spending and betting addiction uh, eating disorders, a lot of times eating disorders uh, is the beginning. Uh, sometimes people will practice eating disorders and spending addiction. Sometimes it crops up after recovery or they're in recovery from uh, the eating disorder. And then there's uh, love and sex addiction. It's that tr those three triplets of uh, spending, dating, eating disorders, and uh, love and sex addiction. And, you know, diets, we do not believe in diets. Diets don't work. Uh, it's something you go on so you can go off of it. And that's how we see uh, spending and dating addiction. You know, we believe in having uh, food plans, have choices of what you eat, over 240 wonderful foods. Same with spending uh, addiction. Uh, you have a spending plan. This is a complex subject, and it, uh, it's, uh, and a lot of people are in it. There are a lot of people are in it right this moment. So, uh, in talking with Misty a few minutes ago, we were talking about the subject for next week, and I'm going to do a part two of the spending and betting addiction because I really want to get in to the solution, and I want to just be able to dabble a little bit, but this is a really tough uh, subject. Uh, when you get in people's pocketbook, a lot of times people do not want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about <clears throat> what's in their plate or what's in their pocketbook or their sex and love, <laughs> you know. I mean, those are off limits for a lot of people. So we're going to focus today on the dating and spending and spending, uh, you can be an overspender and not be in debt. Now, as it keeps going, this is a progressive disease, and as the spending, overspending continues, then that's when the dating starts, uh, and that's when, you know, we can really get in trouble. So, spending is a way to medi <coughs> medicate unhappiness, fear, Anger and low self-esteem and loneliness. Loneliness. It is like that uh, hole in our soul. You know, uh, money, we can use money as a mood changer. Uh, <laughs> someone that's a compulsive spender goes, uh, I mean, for unrealistic reasons. They go and spend. I'm talking about them, you know, like those people. I'll tell you that uh, I am a recovering debtor spender, and uh, <clears throat> and the thing about it is, you know, I was raised very not poor, poor, but a little three-room house. We never had much money. My mother was sick. My dad was, you know, all of that and something else. He was a violent man and all, and. Uh, I always wanted better things. I went to school, it was right after the GI Bill came out. It was after World War II, and you know, we lived in this little old tiny house in Odessa, Texas, which was an oil boom town, and it was, there wasn't, you know, many places to find to live, and they had started putting up these low GI houses. Uh, they were, tr today I know they were track houses, but to me they looked like mansions, literally looked like mansions, you know. Uh, and kids had, obviously, much more than I had. Uh, and, you know, I, my dad had an old pickup, and in the fifth grade, I would, well, fifth and sixth grade, I would drive myself to school in that old pickup. Uh, you know, when you have an alcoholic mom that cannot get out of bed, 
uh, and you live three miles from school and you're a fat kid and when you walk your legs rub together and they get galled. I mean you do not want to walk much you know so I would drive that old pickup but occasionally I would have to walk and I remember walking home from school with some kids one day going through those what I thought were mansions and they all lived in those brick houses and they were asking me where I lived and I made up where I lived in one of those <laughs> houses I mean I lied about it and then they were asking me, and I picked out a house, and they asked me about uh, if I had TV. And uh, I said, oh yeah, we have TV. And they said, well, you don't have an antenna on the house. And I didn't know anything about TV. TV had just come out, and what I said was, well, we have dog ears. I meant rabbit ears. <laughs> you know, a kid, I would make up fantasies. You know, I said, we have, dog ears on our TV instead of an antenna. So that shows you that things matter to me a lot as a kid because I didn't have anything. And so I wanted stuff. I wanted stuff and started working at, uh, when I was 13 years of age and all of that. And uh, so any excuse can make you feel, give you that sense of entitlement. I felt I was entitled as I got older to have more things, to buy things. You know, an eating disorder person, any addict, is we're like a grabber person. We want to grab something out here and bring it inside to make ourselves feel better. You know, whatever it is, that hole in the soul. Now recovery, and I'm going to talk more about that next week, recovery is uh, there is not any amount of any substance food, alcohol, drugs, spending, any process addiction that can fill that hole in the soul. Addictions, it's a spiritual problem, and the only solution, I believe, is spiritual. So, where compulsive overeaters <clears throat> uh, and alcoholics can fall in this, and a lot of your drug addicts can be big-time spenders, <clears throat> but your compulsive overeaters, a lot of times, and your bulimics will really be your big time compulsive spenders. Now, your anorexics will go the other way. They will be as miserly with their money at times. Uh, you know, they'll have the first dollar that they ever earned. Uh, they hold on, you know, where compulsive overeaters, alcoholics, drug addicts, we try to bring something in to make ourselves feel better. An anorexic will hold on to whatever they have uh, for fear of if they let it go that there will never be anything to take its place. So I want to talk, uh, you know, without it all being all about me, that, you know, uh, my spending addiction was bad. Now, you know, like I said, I started as a kid wanting to, you know, to look better, and I was overweight, and I had to have everything made. But anyway, uh, when I started having children, my husband and I, I had a husband, <laughs> my husband and I, when we, I started having children, <clears throat> I made a decision that my kids were not going to do without anything, regardless of what I had to do to get it. You know, they went to a small school. Now it's a big, huge school. At that time, it was a small school. And the kids that they went to school with, my daughters will say even now, they thought that my kids were rich because of the way they dressed. I made sure they looked good. I spent all week going out and buying stuff to make them, you know, look good because if they looked good, it made me look good. And I never bought anything for myself. You know, at that time I weighed, you know, uh, 270 all the way up to 287. And so I wouldn't buy a lot of stuff for myself. I bought for my kids so they would look good. And that, like I said, made me look good. So I went off to treatment 35 years ago for my eating disorder. Now, before then, I had gotten into compulsive spending. Uh, my husband was in the oil field, was in the oil business. He had a small uh, oil field equipment business. And we had money, or we didn't have money, depending on the oil business. You know, it was like a roller coaster. Uh, and so when we had money, I mean, we spent money. And when we didn't, uh, I mean, it would drive fast. Whatever we saved would be gone quick. 
Uh, and so I'm just telling you this, that uh, I went to work. I didn't have any education. And so it still embarrasses my kids for me to talk about it. But I was willing to do anything to bring in some money. And so I would take in ironing. That's when people ironed in their, you know, at home. A dollar fifty a dozen was the going price. I kept kids. And then I went to work at a hamburger joint, fried hamburgers. So I have a little problem when people say they can't find a job in today's time. Make a job. You can make a job. And uh, I'm not going to get into all this, but I am going to say I am very much against disability unless a person is very, I'm against disability for addicts of any sort. Temporary, that's okay. We had a, a psychiatrist here, Dr. Lynn Markle, that would come from Dallas for about eight years every Wednesday. And she would not sign anyone's, any addict's disability forms. We had a severe anorexic and her family had got her on disability and Dr. Marvel would not sign it. Because she said in order to sign someone's disability, you're signing their death certificate. Because they have to stay sick in order to draw disability. And for addicts, that is like a, I mean, a death wish. So that's another subject for another time. <clears throat> but the compulsive spending, you know, I went to treatment and I mean, I got in good recovery from my eating disorder, and I'm in good recovery today. Uh, I consider myself recovered, uh, compulsive overeater, bulimic on a daily basis. And I'm not saying that I can't relapse, but I'm in good recovery. Now, what happened that first year is, and I remember it, I remember it distinctly, that I felt so empty, I felt so shaky, that... <clears throat> I remember the first, uh, not the first Saturday that I was home, but the next Saturday I was home, I remember going to the mall with intentions of buying me something. And that started compulsive spending that lasted, and, and credit card abuse that lasted one year. And I ran me up a credit card bill, $20,000. Now, my husband, that's the oil business was good, and he would have paid that off. He said, honey, I'll pay it off. And I knew that I was operating out of an addiction, and I wouldn't let him pay it off. I said, no, I've got to do that. that. I've got to do that. And I really didn't know how to recover from, I knew I was in problems with compulsive spending, but now the debting, the debting, that card, you know, you just take it and charge through the mall, and it felt powerful. It gave me something to bring inside that made me feel better that the food, I could not use food anymore for that. So, <clears throat> I did that for a year, and I started praying for some answers. When you start praying for some answers, you've got to pay attention who God puts in your life. And because the answers can come through a book, it can come through a person that you meet at a 12-step meeting, it can come through lots of, pick up a magazine somewhere, and you might find an article in there about what you're praying. Mine came through, I went to a meeting <clears throat> at the Open Door at our club here, uh, to an open AA meeting. And I won't go into it, the woman is not alive today, she eventually died from her addiction, but what she gave me was the gift of, she talked in that meeting about, and I knew she had gone to prison, she was from a very wealthy family, and I knew she had gone to prison for, I didn't know what, but she talked about it and how a lot of hers was compulsive spending, credit card debts, and then led into hot check writing. Afterwards, I went up to her and talked with her, and I absolutely know, I mean, that was a meeting I normally didn't go to, and I know that God put that woman in my life for, that she was the answer, and we went out and sat in my car, and she talked to me about how she had found help through Debtors Anonymous in Dallas, so I started going to Dallas. And I'll tell you, if you go to a Debtors Anonymous meet, meeting, they are serious. They are serious. They double team. You have two sponsors and not one. Uh, and so I came back to Abilene and my youngest daughter, she helped me, and we started a Debtors Anonymous meeting. I put a little ad in the paper. First Sunday afternoon, we had over 50 people there. At the end of that year, there was two of us, my youngest daughter and myself. 
people have a hard time getting into the pocketbook, getting honest about what they're doing with money, and a lot of them don't, don't want to give it up. Apparently, uh, 48 of those people didn't, but nevertheless, what I found was recovery in that from the debting and spending. Uh, so, you know, it's a pleasurable experience and any, for an addict, <laughs> Any pleasurable activity that we get into, for most addicts with our brains, if we do something twice and it feels good, we're going to keep doing it, you know. I mean, even in recovery, or we'll switch off addiction, and this is what I did, folks. I switched off. I couldn't, you know, eat. I couldn't, you know, fill up my stomach with the food and then find a way to get rid of it. I was committed to my eating disorder recovery. So, I had to find a way to recover from the dating and spending. And so, uh, one of the things is uh, there are seven, okay, so the pleasurable activity, like I said, there's a lot of pleasure that comes out of overeating. It is pleasurable. It feels good, that food going down, until it doesn't. It's like any addiction, you know. And so, when I gave that up, then, you know, the other uh, thing that is pleasurable is buying stuff, that spending. It gives, it's a charge to it. it. I mean, that's a play on words, but it affects the same part of the pleasure part of the brain as any uh, addiction does. And so the love and sex addiction, the spending addiction, and the eating disorder are all triplets. They're tri they are just intertwined together. And so I'm going to briefly go over uh, seven triggers because I want to hear from each of y'all. There is uh, seven triggers to look for. Uh, one thing is that shopper's high. Number one is the shopper's high. <clears throat> uh, it's like a runner's high. If you get a high off of shopping, you might want to look that you might have uh, the beginning of a shopping addiction or it may be full force. You know, we go... Uh, in exchange money for services and goods, you know, something that we need. When it moves beyond that and you get a charge in that uh, runner's high off of spending, you might have a problem. And then <clears throat> look at number two, it can be the solution to problems. If you're lonely, <laughs> uh, you know, and but you can get that card, you know, if you've got good credit, you can get one of those different color cards, you know, and that makes you somebody to have one of those black cards or that platinum card, you know, the feel of the credit card. <laughs> it's like a romance, and that becomes the solution to the problem, that hole in the soul, that going to charge. Uh, and so three is <clears throat> be aware of competition, you know, Merchants are so smart, and they pay big bucks, billions of dollars, to research folks like us, to know what we are going to buy and to get that, to get us out there. That's why Black Friday was <clears throat> invented. It's called competition. And, you know, if they knew, marketers knew, that if they could get people in competition, and they could... Hurry, be the first one in line on Black Friday and all of that and all of that. They don't have enough of that stuff to last very long, those big sale items. But they caught you because you're in the store. I mean, these people are wise. <clears throat> and so that competition. Um, and then, you know, it's human nature that you want the first of something that comes out and all. So that's number three, those triggers that we have to look at. Uh, and then number four, the idea of saving. My mother-in-law was a coupon clipper. I mean, she saved every coupon everywhere and got mad at me if I didn't. And she had a storage building over, to, and she, they lived here in Buffalo Gap, a storage building that was packed full of food that when her and her husband passed away, it was still full of food. A lot of it was outdated. But, you know, people that were uh, raised in the Depression, you know, and they have, didn't have a lot, 
I mean, they have a tendency to buy, buy, buy food and hoard, you know. And so the idea, she would spend so much money with the idea of how much she was going to save. And she'd figure out how much she saved with all these coupons. And then she would give away half the food uh, or it would go bad. So that idea of saving, well, i got to go get this special. This so, you know. And then five, uh, a trigger is... It is so simple, and people laugh about it. They make t-shirts uh, uh, for this called retail therapy. And a lot of people in recovery, they say, well, I can't drink, I can't overeat, I can't do this, I can't do that, uh, but I can go buy me something. And so retail therapy, uh, there's, you know, funny cards made about it, t-shirts made about it. It's not a laughing matter when you run up big debts uh, and when you get afraid to go to the mailbox, and when you do go to the mailbox, you let those envelopes sit around for a long time without opening them. And when you hate to answer the telephone, afraid it's going to be a bill collector, and on and on. And so, uh, like I said, these merchants are wise. Number six is... <clears throat> You know, J.C. Penney's, they were kind of having a hard time, and so they hired this new CEO. So he decided he was going to go in and mainstream J.C. Penney's. And instead of having something that cost, you know, ten ninety nine, he was going to be honest about it and say it was $11. Or instead of twenty four ninety nine, it was going to be $25. Guess what? They're almost bankrupt. Now, because people want to think that they are getting a bargain, you know, at $24.99 or $19.99, he did away with all of that, and their business went to hell in a handbasket, and so did he. He was fired because people want a gimmick. I mean, we're not, I mean, they research consumers. They know what we want and what we need, and so... Uh, we want to think we're getting a bargain. And when you're thinking you're getting a bargain, you need to rethink that and not buy what you're buying right then. And if you really, something you need, if you really need it, if you walk away from it and make a decision, you can go back the next day. Uh, my friend Misty has taught me a lot about shopping. Uh, she savors uh, shopping. Like if she wants to buy something, she'll start thinking about it. And it may be a month before she buys it, or she may not ever buy it. But she researches and she'll go and look. She shops without buying uh, because she wants the best bargain. Now that is an informed shopper. It's not just a compulsive shopper. Uh, and so seven, be aware of how you use shopping as a leisure are for boredom. You know, boredom is the ultimate of self-centeredness. When we're saying, oh, I'm just so bored, what we're saying is we can't stand to be by ourselves. And so, you know, shopping is not a sport, but a lot of compulsive spenders use it as a sport. Like, well, let's just go shopping. Well, y'all, you know, let's have a, a girls weekend and we'll go down to Fredericksburg and we'll go shopping and we'll do this. You know, it's like, uh, you know, looking for the best buyer or the cutest dress or whatever, you know. So, <clears throat> my time is, I mean, is almost, almost up. Betting and shopping can come in different forms. It's really a form of gambling. And, you know, my little husband, he gave me permission to talk about anything about him. He never spent a penny on himself. Every penny of money he had went to his family and his business. Now, what he was was a gambler, and I didn't know that. And I had, a, I'm an, I was a gambling counselor, and I didn't know my husband was a gambler. He was a business gambler. And at 18 years sober, 68 years old, <clears throat> we put him in treatment in Arizona for gambling addiction. And he was there with a lot of other white collar gamblers. But there was also the, what they, you know, it's that high roller type thing. 
like when he first sobered up, <clears throat> his his sponsor, his beloved sponsor, has passed away. We'd go, you know, the oil business was good then, and we'd go out to dinner with maybe 20 or 25 people, and he would pick up the tab for everybody. And his sponsor started watching that. And one time we were at this big dinner party, and he reached over to get the ticket, and my his sponsor stopped and put, put his hand back, and he said, put your billfold in your pocket. Because that's how he got his good feelings about himself, was spending money on other people. Not on himself, but on other people. And then he got into this gambling, a business gambling, and he gambled up his entire retirement. And, you know, he already, I'm telling you this to tell you how dangerous compulsive spending and betting is. He had all, already been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And when it came out about his gambling addiction, his Alzheimer's increased and he was never the same after that. That is how bad it affected his brain. Uh, and we lost Mr. Mack uh, at age 68, a big part of him. Now he lived <coughs> for uh, how many more years? Uh, from 68 to 82. He was 82 years old when he passed away. But I believe his money part, that compulsion to spend and be the big spender, not ever on himself, but to be the big roller, high roller, and his gambling addiction is what helped eat his brain up and increased, and I think it made the Alzheimer's much worse. That is my theory. I live with the man. I am not a physician, but that's my theory. Uh, and when he couldn't do that, when he couldn't buy people things, I think that that is took away so much pleasure from him that he felt like he wasn't anything. So next week, we're going to do a part two. I was going to talk about online shopping. That is the biggest deal today. Monday was Cyber Monday. There was $7.1 billion spent Monday. And we're in a nation that is uh, worse off financially is w than, we, than they were in the Depression. I'm not old enough to have lived in the Depression, uh, but I've heard a lot about it because I was raised by parents who lived in the Depression. Uh, and so this is, I think this is a big enough topic that we need to have a part two because I didn't even touch the uh, recovery. And I'll tell you what the recovery is, and we'll talk more about it next week. There is a plan, and, uh, and if you're interested in it, you can purchase this book by next week. This is a planned program of action, how to get out of debt, and stay out of debt, and live prosperously. The man who wrote this was a debtor himself. This is considered the big book of Debtors Anonymous. Now, they have a disclaimer. They say it's not, but it's actually, I believe, this is what uh, was refer uh, re they referred me to when I uh, started Debtors Anonymous. <clears throat> this, folks, saved my life. The program in here saved my life. It gives you a definite step-by-step-by-step-by-step -step -by -step -by -step to do. Uh, and what it talks about, and I'll talk about it next week, is, you know, like I started with, <clears throat> eating disorder people go on diets so they can go off of them. You know, spenders, after the first year, turn over a new leaf, and they're going to go on a budget, a tight budget. Budgets do not work because we get resentful and we don't have any money to even go to the movie. This is a plan to learn how to get out of debt, and I, I, this is what I use. This is what I work out of, uh, and it works if you work it. So I want to open it up and hear what y'all talk about. Now keep in mind what I said. Anorexics a lot of times will not spend anything. They do the spending much like they do the eating, you know, or uh, not all, it's not ever, nothing is all, you know, but, a, but the ones that I've treated, many of your anorexics will, I mean, they are very tight with their money. Uh, and then uh, your compulsive overeaters, it's like more, <laughs> there's never enough. One's too many and a thousand pair of shoes is not enough. I mean, I can tell you about, uh, you know, and I will tell you, uh, 
spenders get have enablers too. I had a dear friend in Atlanta who was a physician, and she dressed wonderful. And I won't go into her story, but I believe she died of, of her body broke down from her indebtedness. I will believe it till the day I die. But we'd go shopping. She went to Neiman's. I've never been to Neiman's. I'd see something that I liked. She would call my husband, and he would have her buy it for me. That's why I have these. Uh, I've got some name brand purses, and I've got way too much stuff that I've never needed. But she enabled. If she couldn't spend, she would get my husband to buy. So this is a complex problem, spending and debting. So... Tune in next week and we're going to talk more about the solution. We've talked a lot about the problem and we've just really touched on the problem. But it is about trying to get our good feelings about ourselves outside ourselves. So let's open it up to you to ask questions or to add. You know, one of the things uh, that my husband, bless his heart, he bought our children any and everything that they wanted uh, because he was buying them love and, you know, trying to buy their love and trying to make up for the alcoholism. Uh, and you can't ever do that. It's a disease, just like betting and spending is a disease. And, you know, love is spelled T-I-M-E. It takes time, you know, and that's what we can give to our families this Christmas, this holiday, to our grandkids to our friends time 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 i want to say this then i'll i'm going to open it up uh i was reading in dear abby this morning a wonderful thing and i'd give anything if one of my grandkids would read it and do it but anyway what this granddaughter gave her grandmother for christmas was she wrote a letter 12 letters one for each month and and each letter she wrote things and memories that she remembered doing with her grandmother and listed them in the age and then sometimes she would include a picture and so that was the gift she boxed them all up had each month written over on them boxed them all up put a red bow i don't know a red bow i would put a red bow on it but anyway she wrapped it all up and gave that to her grandmother for Christmas and her grandmother this woman said that was the best gift she'd ever received and so I'm passing that along that maybe uh, you know a wonderful gifts do not have to cost anything it can cost some of our time T-I-M-E alright so let's open up and who would like to start with dating spending addiction Charles my friend 